Hello, hello. And welcome to today's live stream. We are, it is Saturday. It is a beautiful day out. Um, I think we're like mid upper 70s today. So very nice. Uh, we are tying a silver gray today. <clears throat> and um, we're basically going to use the silver gray as a way to demonstrate tinsel bodies and how to uh, really kind of dial those in. Um, it's definitely a skill. And um, the thing about a lot of body work in salmon flies is you can't just correct your body as you tie in the floss or tie in the tinsel. Um, you have to start from the very, very beginning. So here... Um, I've started working on this underbody. Um, I'm not going to, I didn't want to show you all the steps of an underbody because I've done a number of underbodies on, on this before. Um, but uh, yeah, um, I'm just going to finish up this underbody, uh, show you what I mean, and uh, we'll tie a silver, or we'll at least tie at least the first part of silver gray. Um, I hope everybody's doing well. Uh, it's the weekend. It's bright, it's sunny. Well, it's bright and sunny here. Um, but yeah, uh, and I hope everything, everybody's being, uh, being safe and healthy, especially times like these. Um, right. Let's see. I have all my materials. We'll get started. Uh, <clears throat> just a quick announcement at the beginning. Uh, if you enjoy, uh, what I'm doing here and you want to check out more of my work, uh, I'm on Instagram. Sorry, big truck. Uh, I'm on Instagram at justwondering.brad. Um, and if you would like to support the channel and uh, or purchase a fly that you've seen me tie, uh, I'm on Etsy. Studio one two one three is my Etsy shop. Uh, all the money that I get um, from my Etsy shop uh, goes back to either purchasing materials or upgrading a technology that I use to stream. Um, Right now, uh, I have a goal of being able to purchase some HD or, you know, like 1080p uh, webcams uh, so that we can do like multiple angles. Um, I'd really like to be able to show you what I see when I tie. So put like a camera like right here so that you guys can see, um, you know, the, the correct side or the side that I see uh, as well as, you know, my ugly mug. So. <clears throat> let's uh so uh yeah so if you want to support the channel head over to my etsy shop um you know i don't have things like patreon or kofi or or whatever uh because i i don't want to just ask money from you i want to be able to give you something in return uh as a thanks for supporting me and obviously purchase a fly uh you get a fly <laughs> you get a fly in return um so silver gray uh, I did remember to straighten a bunch of crests here. You can see I'm just using, uh, so I actually use this um, flooring tile as my background for photos, but I also find that it's a perfect kind of plate to use to straighten crests. Um, all I do is I soak them in a little bit of water. Uh, sometimes I might add some dish detergent if it's a particularly dirty uh, crest or a head that, I that I'm taking them from. And uh, then I put them on the plate, let them dry out. And uh, they usually dry out uh, in whatever position you put them in. Uh, so if you want straight crests, you just kind of, after soaking them, you just kind of manipulate them into being straight. Um, I've said this before, I will say this again. I do not like using straightened crests on my flies because if, they, if you um, store them in a humid place, uh, over time, they will eventually go back to their t original twisted state. Um, and, uh, that's because the humidity is essentially reversing the effects of soaking them and straightening them. Uh, so I try to avoid using them, uh, but can't be helped right now. Um, the, uh, the, the, um, the golden pheasant heads that I'm working with, uh, uh have been picked clean of their straight crests already because, uh, I'm getting down to the last couple of feathers. So needing to straighten those, uh, but yeah. Uh, so I remember to straighten some crests, so uh, progress, right? Okay, so this underbody, um, 
when doing a tinsel underbody or uh, when doing a tinsel body fly, um, whether it's, you know, just like one segment or um, like half of the body or a third of the body, or if it's the entire body, as in the case today, the underbody is the most kind of important part of the fly that affects how the finished body will look. Um, and that's because if there are any lumps or any, you know, divots or, or valleys uh, in the underbody, that will affect how the tinsel lays on top. And so you want a continuous and um, as smooth as possible underbody to go under a tinsel body. Um, and the, the thread that I'm using for the underbody is actually uh, this um, Vivas gel spun. Um, it is not my favorite thread for underbodies, but going under a tinsel underbody, I like it because this um, thread, uh, just because of the way it's manufactured, or um, it doesn't have as much give. So, like if you, I were to use uh, like a unistretch, um, and I were to tie a body on top, that the unistretch actually still has some give on the fly. Um, and that's not quite ideal for a tinsel underbody, I find, because you can, if you pull the tinsel a little too hard, you can actually compress the unistretch uh, in the underbody and create extra little uh, divots and things. Um, so, you know, the gel spun, not my ideal underbody um, thread, but for this application, uh, I, I think it's okay. So... Uh, I'm just going to finish up this underbody, and hopefully not mess it up live. Now, if you're having trouble getting your underbody thread or any thread to go go on flat, uh, you can always just untwist it by spinning your bobbin. Um, or what I also like to do is I like to saw back and forth as I wrap. And that just helps, you know, a little bit of, you know, the friction with the, the thread that's already there um, just helps spread the thread fibers out. Uh, you'll, <laughs> you'll see me doing this all the time and, and uh, look like I have like shakes or something, but no. Um, it's just helping to flatten my thread out as much as possible. Uh, you don't want the thread to be so flat that it, you know, becomes too broad. You just want it to be nice and even and um, not lumpy uh, or uh, not with any obvious lumps, I should say. And then when you do the turnaround, you can take one turn and then the next turn you advance and you want that bulk to be on the back side. Uh, so, you know, the crossover... If you think of it like you make one turn going in this direction, and you bring it around and you have to cross over and go back in the other direction, um, you want that crossover to be on the back side of the hook. Um, and that just avoids having any bulk uh, on the underside because the, the, the geometry of the hook bend means that if you put more material on the bottom, it has a bigger effect, it makes a bigger lump. Um, so... You just want that turnaround to be in a place where the bulk will be hidden. You'll never be able to get rid of that bulk from the turnaround. You just want to make sure it's not in a critical spot, if that makes sense. And now that I have my underbody, so that's, so this is actually, although I just showed you a, a single pass, so a pass is down and back. Um, even though that was just a single pass, I've actually put, that That was my third. Um, this is a three-aught Ron Lucas uh, Harrison Bartley hook. William Bartley and Sons, rather. Um, so it's a three-aught, and... Um, So I suppose 
one one of the things to consider is that uh, we'll be using a double layer of tinsel on the body. Uh, so we don't need quite as much, excuse me, underbody because that extra layer of tinsel uh, is almost as good as a single pass of underbody. So what we're going to do is flatten our thread. We're going to run it forward to where I would like. Uh, let's see. And I'm just going to finish it off. Now, um, and this is more of a whip just to hold it. We're not actually like, you know, tying a big knot. Um, it, it doesn't need to be, it's not like finishing the fly where you need it to be really tight. You just need it tight enough to hold it. So that it doesn't unravel while you tie the rest of the fly on top of it. Because once you tie the rest of the fly on top of it, um, it'll hold itself. So, all right. So as usual, uh, to find out where the butt should be, um, I'm using my bobbin with the tying thread as like a plumb bob, just to find the spot where I want to start. Um, and because this has a silk tip uh, tag with a silver tip, um, I'm going to start the thread at the beginning of the tag, wind it rearward, and that just helps smooth out the tag area. Some fuzzies. Um, so, one of the reasons why I don't like the Vivas thread for underbodies is just because it's so slippery. Um, and if you're tying, trying to tie things directly on top of it, it can be a little bit of a pain. Uh, fortunately, uh, for this, uh, that won't be the case. But sometimes, uh, particularly if I'm doing like a tinsel tip or tinsel tag, uh, where it's just tinsel and no, no. Um, no silk, uh, that can cause the tinsel to slip, uh, slide down the, the tag a little bit more than I would like. So, all right. So the chisel gets tied in on the back side of the hook. Again, you want to reduce bulk underneath the hook at, uh, in the bend. It's fine if you put bulk underneath it once you get onto the flat part, but in the bend, that bulk under the hook can really crowd that and make it, you know, really lumpy in that in that transition area. So once I take a couple of turns around to secure the tinsel, I'm going to pull it gently to the back side of the hook uh, to tie it in, tie it down. And we're, just, we're not going to clip the ends yet because um, if I were to clip the ends right now, uh, there would be a step in the middle of the, the silk for the tag. So we don't want that. Now, uh, I forgot to mention. Um, and one of the things, let me just finish tying down this tag ends of the silver thread here. 
one thing I forgot to mention about um, the, I suppose the nice thing about using the gel spun, the Vivas gel spun for my underbody is that you can actually, um, if you want to make sure that your um, underbody is as smooth as possible, you can actually polish it or um, burnish it. And what you do is you take a burnisher. I think this is actually made for like paper embossing, but um, you can take it and because so normally, if you're going to burnish silk, you want to actually move with the, the wrap, so moving it up and down like this. But because this is gel spun and it's virtually unbreakable, um, at least by you know normal human means, uh, you can actually rub your um, run your burnisher across the wraps like this, and um, that just helps smooth out any lumps. It kind of shifts the fibers around uh, until they, you know, settle. Um, so you can do that. Um, but if you lay down, if you, if you put down a, a nice smooth underbody, uh, you know, if you wrap it smoothly in the first place, uh, you know, none of that's necessary. So. All right, so the silver gray has a yellow silk tag. Um, I will, uh, one quick comment about this pattern is the interesting part of the pattern is it, this, this pattern is described in multiple places. It's described uh, both by Kelson and by Price Tannett. And uh, they both offer different recipes, even though they attribute it to the same or originator, uh, Jay Wright. Um, don't know why. Um, I don't know which one's the correct one because I've never seen the original um, recipe by Jay Wright, but who knows? Um, I just think it's an interesting point. Uh, and we see these kinds of variations in the traditional patterns, uh, even uh, amongst, uh, you know, the same author. The same author in two different works might describe different patterns or different variations on patterns if they've, you know, published multiple works. Um, one that I've pointed out before is, you know, Blacker, uh, William Blacker in his work, uh, um, in his two different works. Um, and I'm blanking on the title of the first one, but I have the second one. Uh, in his in his list of patterns for the river ban, uh, and he lists you know a couple that are similar, but then I think like three or four of them are completely different from between the two different words, which is you know, it's a point of interest, um, but it also kind of makes you know one curious as to you know what happened or, or you know why did he change his mind or or what new patterns um came out it's kind of like you know if you if you peruse the old fly tire magazines from like the the the, the 90s right um so like the fly tire magazines that we or the issues of fly tire that you get today well you know the patterns are are very can be very different. Um, you know, uh, when I started, when I first got started uh, with a subscription to Fly Tire back in the probably late '90s, you know, things like uh, UV. UV uh, UV cured uh, head cements or UV cured epoxies weren't a thing, um, and so you know you ended up with uh, uh, these epoxy epoxy bodied bait fish that essentially had to be turned um, on like a foam roller or or, or you know, whatever, um, and they ended up round. Uh, and one of the things that I've seen not in a fly tire in a magazine necessarily. One of the things I've seen at like shows and such are epoxy bait fish. Now that you can create pretty much any shape like, or a more, I guess, 
anatomically correct or like natural shape um, just by using these UV uh, UV set uh, adhesives or glues or epoxies, um, which is really cool. Um, so yeah, anyway, the point being, I'm always very curious as to what made Blacker change his recommended patterns between his first and second um, you know, treaties on, on fishing uh, for the river band. Uh, I don't know if I will ever know. I'm not, I'm not a fly fishing historian, um, even though I tie historical flies. Uh, I'm more interested in techniques and materials. Um, all right, so the tail. Uh, the tail is a crest or a topping. And and some summer duck or wood duck. Let's see. This is just a three out hook, so I don't need a terribly curvaceous tail or a terribly long tail. Um, as as I, I um, as I probably always say, whenever I'm setting a tail, this the tail determines the proportions of the fly more than any other part. So if the tail is too too tall, then you're going to have to set your wing too tall. If the tail is flat, well, that changes the shape or changes the impression of of the wing. Now, um, as most of you know, I prefer a very a fairly flat tail. However, the style that I'm going for for this fly is more of a modern, um, maybe early, well, definitely a 20th century, although the 20th century encompasses a lot of different styles, definitely a 20th century um, style fly with a, a built wing rather than a mixed wing. Uh, and so I kind of would like, um, you know, my, my tail and topping to meet or come close to meeting if possible. Um, so I'm going for a little bit more of a curved tail than I normally would. And uh, I think this might be just the ticket. All right, so as usual, I'm going to trim my tail topping just down to some stubble. I use that stubble to help lock the tail into place. Just got to smooth out. I got a little bit of a bump here from tying off the floss. That's okay. Um, and I'm going to do because I don't want it to be too tall of a tail. I'm going to actually flatten the tie-in point just a little bit so that the tail droops down over the tag just a little bit. Again, I'm using smooth, smooth jawed pliers to flatten things. So one turn, two turns. There we go. So that's the tag, or that's the tail. I think that looks pretty good. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to wax my thread as usual, just to lock in the tail so it doesn't move because I have to put, um, you know, wood duck, slips of wood duck over as well as a pearl butt. I don't want this to move. Don't want it to shift. Uh, I was listening to an interesting fly tying podcast today, and 
talking about like you know using these well yeah these these uv cured adhesives uh, or glues uh, to essentially glue in place uh, feathers on flies um and i always find it interesting when people say oh you know that's cheating or you know that's not traditional uh and uh to that you know i say well these 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 fly tires from like the, the, the 19th century, so the 1800s, were using, you know, these these waxes that when these, wa you know, they're soft when they're, they're warmed and heated, but when they cool or you, you know, when you fish a fly in a trout stream that's cold, these, these firm up to be rock solid. So, um, and that's basically what held together all of these flies from the, the 19th century. Um, and using this, you know, cobbler's wax is almost as good as gluing in your feathers. Um, so, would I use UV head cement to glue in my feathers on a traditional fly like this? Probably not. But I don't see any reason why it's not perfectly acceptable to do so um, on a modern fly, particularly a fly that you're intending to fish. Got some wood duck. Just gonna cut a couple of relatively narrow. Um, so the recipe calls for wood duck in strands. That simply means slips of wood duck taken off the stem rather than you know like a whole wood duck feather wood duck flank feather um, that would look kind of silly as a tail bailing because you know large <laughs> that'd be like an extra large tail bailing well you laugh i've seen there are patterns that call for, you know, whole uh, golden pheasant tippets or um, jungle cock eyes. So I'm not, I would not be terribly shocked to learn that there are patterns out there which call for whole wood duck feathers. sure anything didn't quite have that properly lined up Duck is such a difficult feather to work with because it is so incredibly soft. It just wants to crumple. I don't think that helps too much about the humidity today, which is causing those feathers to frizz out just a little bit. All right, so that's pretty good. Took a little bit of effort, but that is not bad. Forward, 
again, because I'm, like usual, because I have a pearl butt, I'm okay with trimming a lot of this stuff on where in the area under the butt rather than running it all the way forward like I, I, I you would normally do um, if you didn't have a butt. But I've got a butt. I should say this fly has a butt. Okay. Pearl. Uh, I'm actually not going to use the largest pearl that I have because this is, again, just a three-aught hook. stuff. No, I'm not. So it might look like this is a smaller feather than this. Um, but in fact, the fibers on the hurls of these two feathers are almost the exact same length. So I'm looking for something with kind of a short barb or a short fiber This might be it. Now, it does mean I get a slightly shorter piece of hurl, but that's okay. Uh, I'm not planning on putting a hurl head on this fly, so I don't need to match in any way with the hurl that I'm going to use on a head because I'm not going to put any hurl on the head. So, just put away some feathers here so I know. Whew. I am a little bit shaggy because I haven't had a haircut. But my wife likes long hair, so I should say she is not opposed to it, which in my mind means she likes it and not well enough, so I won't complain too much. Just want to cover that little bit of bulk built up. Now this is a super nice hurl. It's the, the barbs on the, uh, the individual hurls are very dense. So you get these very nice thick butts. That's thick with two C's. All right. So here's the challenge with the silver gray. Uh, and this is true of a lot of the tinsel bodied flies, like some like the silver doctors. Uh, if you do a palmered version of like the silver Wilkinson or um, uh, the silver test or the silver tay or uh, anything that has a palmered hackle over a tinsel body, it's where do you start the hackle? Um, I personally, in general, prefer to start the hackle at the second turn of rib. By the way, uh, I'm using Legarden tinsels. Not sponsored, although if they would like to sponsor me, I would not say no. Uh, I like to start my hackle at the second turn of rib uh, because I think that looks classy. Um, it also helps with the illusion of a finely tapered body hackle. So uh, there's that. Um, but the difficulty with a tinsel body is that uh, if you tie in the hackle now, uh, which I'm going to do, uh, you tie in the hackle now, you have to wrap the body, the tinsel for the body around the hackle, or you have to work around it. Um, and that's not such an easy thing to do unless you have like three hands. And I don't. Um, I will 
there's no easy way to do it. Um, normally, if I were doing like a floss body, I would use the floss to tie in the hackle. Uh, you know, so I would wind the floss down. And then as I wound the floss back to the front, I would use that floss to tie in the hackle. Um, I have found that that doesn't work so well with tinsel. Uh, I don't know if it's because the tinsel is more slippery and the hackle pulls out more or the tinsel itself tends to cut the stem of the hackle. Um, I mean, that's a problem you're going to run into no matter how you tie in the hackle, but uh, it's just something that, that, that that's a struggle uh, with tying tinsel bodied flies. Um, there's not a whole lot of ways around it, but that's, you know, part of the challenge, I suppose. So I have this very lovely silver ba silver badger um, or very light honey colored badger, uh, uh, Indian cape, I guess, uh, or what we would call an Indian or Chinese cape. Uh, going to pick. So um, got this from John McLean and Terry over at feathersmc.com where I get most of my feathers. But I'm just going to pick a very nicely tapered and you want, you want a well tapered hackle for your body. Uh, and you want one with a very striking bar down the center. So I think, yeah, this one I think should do. I'm gonna just pull away the fluff at the bottom or most of the fluff. I like to keep a little bit of fluff at the bottom. Uh, that makes a convenient handle to hold on to when winding it. Um, and it also reminds you of the direction because when you fold the hackle, sometimes you can get it twisted and having a little bit of, you know, extra fluff at the back end just kind of reminds you which direction you meant to fold it in. Okay. So now trying to decide where to tie it in and uh, some of it is just going to be a little bit of a guess. Um, but the idea is if you want your hackle to start at the second turn of rib, then you have to decide where that second turn of rib is going to occur. Um, now, the way I tie in my hackle is I tie it in by the tip on the back side. Well, back side to me, um, the side closest to the camera for you. I tie it on the back side. And so um, I actually have to determine where that back side will be uh, on the second turn of rib. And I know from experience that the second turn of rib will cross underneath the will hit the six o'clock position or the bottom of the hook at approximately one quarter of the way down the body, which means I have to tie in the hackle a little bit short of one quarter. So I, I usually try to shoot for between a little bit more than one fifth of the way down and a little bit less than a quarter. Um, that's a little less critical when you're trying to tie with, or when you're tying in with floss. Um, it's a little bit more critical when you're tying with tinsel, but uh, I know that there are people who have invented a number of like dividers that you can use to determine where to tie in your hackle. Um, those are cool and useful, uh, but they also, you know, um, They slow me down <laughs> and eventually you'll, you'll get a feel or I certainly did got a feel for just placing the hackle where I wanted it. Uh, yeah, the dividers are a great tool. Um, and I used to, I used to have one, you can print them out online um, from people uh, who have made ones and they've made them available for free, some of them for free on, on the internet. 
uh, yeah, they're definitely a useful tool for learning, but eventually you'll just get the feel for feel for it. Uh, trim. All right, so I'm gonna wind with flat wraps all the way to the front. And uh, in order to keep it as smooth as possible, I'm just doing side-by-side -side wraps. So there's one area of unavoidable bulk, and that is always going to be where you tied in the eye. Um, so the, blunt, the, the gut eye uh, is always going to introduce a little bit of bulk, particularly if you're like me and you're cheap and you only use a short segment of gut. Um, it's just unavoidable. Sorry, no words of wisdom around that. It's just unavoidable. Uh, all right, so we are going to use um, flat silver medium uh, Legarten tinsel. Uh, I use medium instead of uh, wide or like the large flat tinsel uh, because by wrapping on, uh, by using a slightly narrower tinsel, uh, you can get around any changes. So like any tapers that you might've put into your underbody. Um, so this has got a pretty good taper, uh, which I like. I, I really like having a good tapered body, but if you have a pretty sharp taper, uh, if, you, if you like having a sharply tapered body, or if you have one part of the body that is more tapered than the other, uh, using a very wide tinsel can actually be more difficult because that wide tinsel will have a have a more difficult time conforming to the taper, uh, whereas a, a a more narrow taper or a more narrow tinsel uh, will have an easier time conforming to any taper that you've included. Um, now, in order to tie it in, I've cut a, a sharp point in the end. I'm going to tie it in by that sharp point. That just reduces the bulk uh, from the tinsel. Uh, particularly since, you know, um, as you wrap the tinsel, uh, that first wrap, you have to, f it actually ends up folding the tinsel. All right, so then we'll just wrap side by side wraps all the way down. being very careful not to trap the hackle under the tinsel. Uh, I really like this Lagarden tinsel because it's enameled, uh, so it will resist tarnishing. And it just looks very, it's a very nice product. Um, but, if you're going for that kind of vintagey look, this is not the stuff for you. Uh, this this is this is very brightly finished, so uh, it will not look vintage. All right, so I get to the hackle. I'm gonna have to do this twice because I have to do it both down and back. And this is where I cannot imagine trying to do this in hand because you need at least three hands. All right. Just to tie around the hackle. 
managed to just trap the single fiber, which is a-okay for me. So I get to this point and we're going to turn around the uh, tinsel, make one full wrap, and then again, crossing and back. And we're going to wrap back forward, again, being very, very careful to make side-by-side -side wraps. Um, I like having two layers of tinsel because uh, having that extra layer on top, one, um, it disguises any gaps that you might leave in the wrapping of your tinsel. So if you have two layers and you accidentally leave a gap, no big deal. Um, two, it helps smooth it out because you got two layers of fairly rigid tinsel. And, you know, and as, as I said, when I was laying down the underbody, it does add more, a little bit more bulk. So it does look a little bit beefier, a little bit chunkier. Uh, it is not a cheap way to do a tinsel body tail. <laughs> um, you know, I think... As you, as you see here, I just used about 18 inches of silver tinsel. Uh, that's a lot. Um, and silver tinsel and, you know, metallic tinsels are uh, can be, particularly if you're using vintage or true vintage, uh, not inexpensive. So. So I'm going to tie that off and then I'm going to cut a taper in the end and you bind that down. Um, and as you can see, there's a little bit of bulk around where the uh, there's a little bit of bulk around where the, the gut eye is tied in, but that's slightly hidden. Uh, because of the double wraps, um, it just looks like a very, you know, it's all very kind of uniformly there. All right, so then I'm going to wrap my um, rib. Now I'm using small Legarten silver oval. And when I do a tinsel body, I tend to use a smaller or like a, a, a slightly thinner rib than I would on a floss or um, or dubbed body because the silver tinsel, you know, the way I I guess I look at it is that the it, it stands the rib stands out a little bit more. Um, Although technically it, it doesn't like, it doesn't need to be as quite quite as prominent. It doesn't have. It's not fighting with uh, a whole bunch of fibers, like on a dubbed body. Um, it's sitting on top of you know more tinsel, so it's not it's not uh, in conflict or it's not trying to make uh, uh, be present around. Uh, a whole lot of extra bulk. There's no, there's no extra bulk here. So even a, even a finer um, rib stands out against the, the tinsel body. So as usual, I'm going to fold the hackle on the fly, just sweeping the fibers to the back side of the hackle.
going to wrap. So one of the reasons why I um, start tie the, the hackle on the back side is because whenever you wrap a hackle, there's always a little bit of space where the hackle and the fibers don't quite match up. Um, it's just because there's always, I don't know, there always seems to be a gap before the actual fi hackle fibers start. And um, by tying the hackle on the back, I can mitigate that just a little bit. Uh, and ensure that the hackle fibers start right at the bottom, right at this, you know, the, the bottom or where the, the second uh, turn of rib crosses underneath the hook. And I want to wrap the hackle on the back side of the rib. tie off the hackle underneath. Now this does have a throat, so I'm not going to make any extra turns of hackle. I'm just going to tie that off. Secure everything down. Alright, so that's the and now we'll just use the throat. Now the throat um, in the pattern uh, calls for, I believe, widgeon. I am going to use green wing teal because I have a ton of teal and it looks similar enough. Um, if anything, the the teal is a little bit more uh, has slightly more distinct bars or uh, barring, which I like. Uh, so generally speaking, I will use teal or um, or even Gadwell over, you know, Gray Mallard or Widgeon, unless uh, unless you know, kind of like the fainter or the more muted barring is a feature. Um, sometimes, sometimes flies look better with a, or a more muted barring, but for example, like you know, throats um, and and hackles, uh, just like spay fly hackles, uh, really benefit from the more distinct barring. Um, I think display flies look better, or flies that are put on display look better with uh, more distinct barring. So that is what I'm going to use. I'm going to wax, wax my thread before tying it in per usual, just so I don't pull the hackle out as I wrap it. Um, And you only need a couple of turns. So I'm only going to do like two turns of teal. Uh, and for many teal feathers, you are only going to get two turns.
just a little bit. Finish binding that down. All right, so because this is teal, um, and because I'm tying in a more modern style, I am going to pull the throat hackle down to the bottom. I'm not going to pull the body hackle because uh, I kind of like it. Um, I like the bushier body hackle because that helps fill the space between the body and the underwing, um, if there is an underwing. Um, but on a... Uh, I'm more, sorry, on a modern style fly, um, having the throat hackle pulled to the bottom is pretty typical. Uh, so I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to whip finish my white thread. And uh, when I do the wing, uh, when I tie in the wing, which I'll, I'll, I'll do next week, um, Whip finish the white thread and I'll switch to black. Um, I always switch to black thread when it has like a a a, uh, a, a lacquer finished head or a head cement finished head uh, because the black thread the black thread uh, just covers up any gaps that you might have. Um, it's kind of like filling in that that gap or that area where your thread may not be covered by head cement um, with like black shadow, excuse me. So that's what I do on all flies that receive a lacquer head. Uh, if I were gonna dub the head, of course I'd stick with white, um, but I'm not, I'm not dubbing the head, so. So there we go. Uh, this is the body of the silver gray by Jay Wright as described by Price Tannett. Um, we'll do the wing next week, uh, two part fly as normal. Um, and, uh, yeah, so thanks for hanging out. Uh, just to give a little bit of a teaser, uh, I've been working on something else this week. Um, I did not do this on video because I am tying this for myself. Uh, I don't normally tie this particular fly because I think it is well represented, uh, maybe over represented in the fly tying world, but I am tying this fly. Um, you may recognize it. If you don't, I'm not going to tell you what it is. I'll show you it. On my, it'll be on my Instagram when I finish it, probably sometime later this week. Um, but thanks for hanging out. Uh, like I said, we'll finish the silver gray next week. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope everybody is staying healthy. Uh, staying safe. If you enjoy my work, want to see more, go check out my Instagram, justwondering.brad on Instagram. And if you want to support the channel or purchase any of the flies you've seen me tie, uh, it's Studio1213 on Etsy. Uh, I appreciate any of the support you, you uh, can give. Um, we've got lots of different flies on the Etsy right now. Um, so yeah, thank you. Uh, and have a good rest of your weekend. And uh, I'll talk to you next time.